Hello, my beautiful people. It's been too long. With all the talks about abortions, trusting science, and whatnot, I thought we should come back to some of the basics, if you know what I mean. Could life have started from simply natural processes? Little bit of chemistry here, dash of physics there, a lot of time, and boom, we've got the beginning of life. Abiogenesis, right? You know, one thing I will give them credit for is all the effort and animations they put into this video series. It looks gorgeous, and compared to my videos, it is a lot more fun to watch. You may be giving pseudoscience out to your audience, but at least you're doing it at a way that's entertaining. We've already detailed a number of serious issues with abiogenesis in these videos. But just like your favorite superhero movie, let's briefly ignore the laws of physics. We'll just assume that all of the scientific challenges mentioned in those prior videos have been vaporized. Coincidentally, I also made videos responding to those videos explaining why science does work. Will I be too lazy to put their links in the description? Probably, but that depends on future me. So, we now have lots of building blocks, biopolymers, and a cell membrane that is fully equipped to maintain homeostasis. Awesome. We still wouldn't have life yet, because life is built around something called gradients. Gradients will always exist, yes, but if you think about it, if they didn't exist, then what's really the point of a container or cell membrane? Now, I already know what he's going to say. He's going to say something along the lines of, you need gradient for energy, such as protons. And then he's going to give us an account somehow on how the first life on Earth can't create this gradient or something. For those of you who don't know, in our cells, we use a proton gradient to flow through the membrane of the mitochondria in order to turn a turbine to create ATP, the cell's energy source. Virtually all living organisms do this to some degree, at least in modern times. Now, he's going to explain a bit on what gradients are, which is fantastic since it saves me some explanation time. A gradient is basically more of something over here, and less of it over there. The opposite of a gradient is equilibrium. Physics loves equilibriums, but not so much gradients. For instance, water likes to be in equilibrium, all spread out evenly. But if you build a dam, you can create a gradient, collecting a bunch of water on one side, and not a lot of water on the other side. The water naturally wants to flow down from the high side to the low side, and this is where energy can be harnessed. Life does the same thing, except instead of water, cells use proton gradients to capture energy. It's super important. No gradients, no life. Let's hang on for just a second. The thing is, a gradient is used really as a converter of energy from one source to the next. In our own cells, for example, we consume energy in the form of chemical energy in food, where heavily reduced carbon chains hold energy within their bonds. As we process this energy, it goes through a series of steps, including glycolysis, oxidation, catabolism, the Krebs cycle, and then the electron transfer chain and ATP synthase. Each of these steps are technically converting energy from one form to the next. ATP is produced from multiple areas here, and we also get NADH and FADH2 from the Krebs cycle. This is another form of energy where instead of them being stored in carbon bonds, there are in electrons held by these electron transporters. This then moves to the mitochondrial membrane and converts this into a gradient by pumping protons into its inner membrane space. This gradient then allows the protons to flow back into the mitochondria where it is then captured by ATP synthase and converts it into ATP from ADP. Now, what's the point of all of that? Yes, it means a gradient here, in this case protons, is only a form of energy, sort of like an intermediate step in converting unusable energy into usable energy. Which means, since it is not a source of energy, life technically could have evolved in a different way without proton gradients. In other words, proton gradients is not mandatory. So when you said no gradient, no life, that's not necessarily true. Why nearly all life today uses this gradient method is a mystery that bewildered the minds of scientists in the 20th century for decades. But it does shed some light on the first eukaryotes, early life forms, and evolutionary biology. To advance further toward life, we would need a continuous supply of these energy gradients and a way to harness them. Some scientists claim that there were plenty of energy sources to support the first proto-life forms. Hydrothermal vents, the sun, lightning, hydrothermal vents, volcanoes, hydrothermal is it really the case that life could have started with these kinds of energy sources? Let's take a closer look. Those are energy sources, so a proton gradient would come further down the line as an energy converter. It's true, the universe has plenty of raw energy out there, but there's a very important difference between that and what life can actually use to exist. Life is pretty picky. It needs very specific kinds of energy, and it needs to be fed it in a very particular kind of way. Otherwise... It's kind of like trying to charge your cell phone with a charcoal grill. There's lots of energy in the grill, but none of it is usable for your poor dying phone. 
agreed life on Earth evolved using ATP, adenosine triphosphate, which is known as the universal energy currency for all living organisms today. Well, actually, that's not entirely true. We also use other forms of phosphate-attached nucleotides such as GTP, UTP, and CTP, which are more often used for communication and signaling purposes within cells. That being said, that doesn't mean life absolutely must have evolved using ATP. The first life forms on Earth, in fact, likely didn't and possibly used something similar to an ATP structure with phosphate bonds, say an acetylphosphate. The point is, although I agree that cells in general today can only use a specific form of energy, you can't really apply that logic immediately to the first life forms on Earth. The first life forms probably did need something specific like a phosphate attached compound, but that specific thing could have been many options depending on how the first life form originated and evolved. I say this all the time when talking about abiogenesis. It's dangerous to apply what we know about life today to the first life forms on Earth. To harness the raw energy of the grill into something your phone can use, you would need a set of pretty complex machines a boiler to heat water into steam, a turbine that the steam pressure can spin, an electric generator, then transformers, converters, regulators, to get the energy in just the right form. You're not actually implying that the early energy sources such as hydrothermic vents actually just kill the first cells, are you? Even the simplest forms of life harness energy through a three-step process. The fancy term for this process is romantically known as First, three proton pumping complexes known by their friends as NADH ubiquinone oxyreductase, coenzyme Q cytochrome C oxyreductase, and cytochrome C oxidase. These guys are also known as the respiratory complexes and together are made of about 25 different proteins, each of which is very fancy in its own regard, consisting of hundreds of precise amino acids. Anyway, these proton complexes use electrons that are stripped off the cell's food source to power machines that pump protons, known as proton pumps resulting in fewer protons inside the membrane and more protons outside, which conveniently provides an electrical voltage, or a gradient. The respiratory complexes have to be complex because stripping electrons is a dangerous process, like handling a bomb. If any of the 15 reaction steps in this process are mishandled, the loose electrons will destroy the first molecule they encounter. But physics is pretty unhappy about these protons getting kicked out of the cell membrane club and wants to shove them back in. So, step two. The disgraced protons are only allowed back into the cell if they first turn an electric generator called ATP synthase. In the simplest form of life, ATP synthase is a machine made from at least 20 interconnecting proteins, and it requires other proteins to help assemble it too. Complexity upon complexity. Let me make this clear. Yes, this is entirely true. It's exactly how energy is produced in cells. Today, we can agree. Yes, it's complex. Yes, it is built by and is dependent on many different proteins. But no, this does not have to apply to the first life forms on Earth. Remember, we've had billions of years of evolution. The process we have today most definitely works better than the processes we've had in the beginning of life's formation. There's no need for the first life to be perfect because it isn't. If it has a few less functional areas, such as lesser control over free electrons, that doesn't mean it can't function up to a certain point. And that's exactly what we see in evolutionary biology in general through DNA and fossil evidence. As we move further and further back in time, organisms get simpler and simpler. So of course, once we reach the first life forms on Earth, it's going to be incredibly different compared to the life we see today. Again, I can't stress this enough. We cannot compare the first life forms on Earth to life as we know living in the present. That just makes absolutely no sense. Here's the paradox. The cell needs to make ADP, the empty batteries of life, before they can be charged up to ATP and put to use. But producing one new empty battery requires at least seven already charged batteries. So you can't make ADP until you already have ATP around in the cell. Okay, I'm going to stop this right here. This video has sort of went away from its original point. It's not really talking about gradients anymore. It's now just talking about ATP and the energy system as a whole, which is fine. Again, like I said, the first life forms didn't necessarily have to have used ATP, but it could be something that stored energy in the form of phosphates, such as an acetylphosphate, which forms pretty spontaneously. Your point revolves around the fact that ADP and ATP has to be around already, making it sound as if they're cell-manufactured molecules, perhaps requiring energy to begin with, but that's simply not the case. There are other mediums of energy that could be used by the first life forms, and then you get a slow transition to what we see today. And even if we talk about the gradient and proteins you mentioned earlier regarding pumping protons across the cell membrane, well, that actually also has a natural source. Let me pose a leading example here just to let you see how the first life forms could have obtained energy. And this is actually more for the audience rather than the narrator behind the video because he does talk about this later on. Anyway, at hydrothermal vents in the oceans, there are deposits of minerals which react to form an 
alkaline environment. The seawater is naturally acidic, so you have a constant differential of proton gradients that quickly form, but also quickly equalize as the alkaline substances diffuse into the general ocean waters. This process differs from life today, because while life today uses a different form of energy to actively pump protons, this is more of a naturally occurring process that doesn't require input from the organisms themselves. As a result, early prokaryotes that reside on the border of acidic and alkaline is able to harness this electromagnetic gradient and naturally form a primitive energy currency such as acetophosphate. Thinking about this, you actually don't even really need a membrane for this process, although early life forms most likely did have one. It's as simple as it gets and comes from naturally occurring processes. Of course, this is just a scenario for one of many potential energy sources, and of course we're always learning more as scientists work on the problem. The main thing to keep in mind is to not apply everything we know about organisms today to the first organisms on Earth, because that logic will simply not work. Now, the video actually goes on to talk about the gradient of hydrothermal vents later on. He tries to debunk it, but like everything else, it isn't actually scientifically sound. But I think what I'll do is split this video into two parts, and I'll address the later arguments in a sequel of some sort. Huge shout out to Fireshard, Alan Morton, Ms. Fixit, and Edward Martin for their constant support on Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.